Hey everybody, welcome to KM Reviews. I am Middleman. Today we're going to be talking about how to play Yucatan. Now, uh, if you didn't see my unboxing and reboxing video, there is a link below where I show how I kind of organized everything, how I set up the player trays, all that sort of stuff. This video is strictly how to play the, the main game, not the solo mode, and not the five to six player expansion stuff. This is going to be a setup and overview and how to play just the base game. At the end of the video, I'm going to be going over some rules clarifications, some icon clarifications, because as we all know, the base rule book that came out is a little messy. So uh, if you're watching this video later on after they've come out with a new rule book, well, this video was made before that. Uh, right now, the rule books are a little bit... So, Yucatan, let's get going. Initially, you're gonna to want to set up the city board as well as choosing three of these buildings. The one with the X on it, this is for experienced players. So choose three of them randomly and place them in the cities. Next, you're gonna to wanna to place the city temple by the board and make sure this dial is set to round one. Next, you're gonna to wanna to set up the evolution track. In this case, you have the option of the three evolution pyramids. However, I recommend using the board. These correspond to the same things, but the board has certain rewards depicted on them that the pyramids do not show. So if you use these, you're gonna need this out anyways to remember what these are until they come out with some sort of updated sticker pack or something. So for this tutorial, we're not gonna use those. We're gonna use this. Next, you're gonna to wanna to make sure every single player has one of these player trays. In this tutorial, I'm gonna set up with three players. Next, you're gonna choose somebody to be the first player. They will get this token and they can slot it right there. Next, make sure each player starts off with two jade and five corn, which you can place at the bottom of the board. Next, make sure your scoring marker and your sacrifice marker are on the zero of the scoring track. You're also gonna to wanna to make sure your evolution tokens are on the first level of each track. Next, you're going to choose two of these five advisor tiles to secretly go into your player tray. The explanation for all these advisors is on your player aid. To be clear, this specific advisor is only to be used if you're playing a five or six player game. Next, you're going to secretly choose a uh, special ability for your city leader, and you're gonna place it face down right up here with your unchosen ones going back to the box. Next, you're going to secretly choose a level one building, all explained on your player aid what they each do, and you're gonna place it face down in its corresponding spot. The rest will be for later. Afterwards, everybody can show what they have selected so everybody knows what each other has. Boom, boom, boom. Done. Next, everybody's going to take one prisoner from the supply and place it in their prison. Next, everybody is going to be putting out two troops. Each one is going to contain a uh, troop leader and three warrior units. Do note that if you start off with the level one barracks, that allows you a troop reinforcement of four as your starting kind of upgraded building. One of your two units will start off with four warrior pieces. Also to clarify, this game basically has four spaces. You have the blue, the red, and the yellow cities. Everything else is one big space, it's a jungle. There's never any fighting in the jungles, it's all one big space. So you're either in one of the three cities or you're in the jungle. The starting troops you have always start in the jungle. Next, each player will take their city leader, holding up these two axes like this, placing it at the bottom of the pyramid. You are not on the steps yet. Next, make sure each player has their five starting battle cards. They will all have the player color at the bottom right. Next, you're gonna to want to shuffle up the special battle cards. The special battle cards are going to have either a blank 
or one of these symbols at the bottom right. They don't represent anything other than if they came up with like a expansion or one of the game ups or just the core games. But these are all your special battle cards. You're going to shuffle those up and create a supply of them somewhere next to the board. Next, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you have a supply of all your monsters. Each one's gonna have a corresponding mini, a card, and a token. The token tells you what level they are. On the back side, it's gonna show you the special ability they have. You're gonna place all of these with the token, the mini, and the card in corresponding levels, one, two, and three. To note, please make sure that if you're playing five or six players, you also include the monkey, these three guys, and this one. If you're not playing five to six players, do not add those. Three of these monsters, the scorpion, that guy, and that thing, are the Kemet crossover ones. That's why they have standees. If you have Kemet, feel free to replace those with the minis, but functionally they are the same and they're optional. We are now set up and ready to play Yucatan. Now, if you only have the base game, you're only gonna have two player aids. If you have the five to six player expansion, you're gonna have two more. I happen to have four player aids for doing that, but I'm never gonna play with more than four players. So everybody's gonna have a player aid. Now, the player aid is very helpful, okay? It explains a lot of things, but there is still some confusion over this stuff. So at the very end of the tutorial, I'm gonna go over what every symbol means, what every building means, what all the icons mean, the missing icons and everything. If you came here for that, feel free to skip forward to that. But let's get to gameplay. Yucatan takes place over the course of four rounds, each one divided into three phases. The action phase consists of three turns, during which each player is gonna place two of their action tokens, a building action token and a leader action token. And this can be placed in either order. On a future turn, a leader has to be a different leader, but the same building can be taken, or it can be a different building. During the sacrifice phase, players are going to simultaneously reveal how many prisoners and resources they've sacrificed. This will potentially move your sacrifice marker, as well as give you a bunch of points. You may also move up on the Great Pyramid. This may also allow you to move up on the evolution board. During the revolution phase, you will revolve the revolution wheel on the Great Pyramid. Monsters that are no longer gonna be around are going to be discarded like a piece of scraps. But they will go back to the pool to possibly be summoned again by you or someone else. Then whoever has the first player marker gets to decide where it goes to. It doesn't necessarily go clockwise. Uh, I'm gonna give it to you. Next, let's go a little bit more in depth on the action phase. This is where the bulk of the game happens, where we're gonna be placing our buildings and our leader tokens. Again, big picture is on your turn, you're gonna be placing one building action token and one leader action token. And you can do these in either order, okay? You cannot place two buildings on the same turn. Always one leader and one building. And to repeat what I said earlier, because it's important, you always have to activate a different leader on a future turn, but you can always choose the same building or a different building on a future turn. After everybody has placed all three of their leaders and all three of their building tokens, that's when you will go to the sacrifice phase. But what do all these things do? Well, we're gonna talk about these special abilities at the very end, but Let's go over all these buildings and how movement with your leaders and troops work. We have the construction site, which will allow you to build up these different buildings. We have the military school that will allow you to upgrade your troops. You have the barracks. This will allow you to reinforce your troops on the map. You have the temple. This will allow you to get those cool summons. Then we have the granary, and this allows you to get three corn. Just do note, while this uh, granary does have an inlay, that is not a building that will ever be upgraded. That's just the way the board is. Also, do not forget that at the very beginning of the game, you should get a free level one building of your choice. They're all base zero level buildings. So this would be a level one. This would be a level two. They show you at the top what level they are. 
in your player tray, this should all be sectioned off. The different types of buildings and then the levels, level one, level two, and level three. If you wanna make it really nice, make it the same as your player aid. So how does the construction site actually work? Essentially, it tells you what cost you need to pay multiplied by how many steps up you're taking to the next level. At the beginning of the game, we all start off with level one of everything, so you cannot construct anything than a level one, higher than a level one. In a future round though, you may be higher up. If you're on a level two, well now you can construct level two buildings. If you're all the way there, you can construct level three buildings. So how does that look in practice? Well, if you put your little uh, building tile there, let's say I wanted to build a level one military school. I'd pay one jade and one corn, boom, boom, to the bank, and I could build a level one military school. Now, let's say I am on level two of the building track. You do not have to build these in order. I do not have to build a level one and then a level two. I could jump straight from a level zero to a level two. That would mean I'm taking two steps up, right? So one jade and one corn times two would be two jade, boom, and two corn. Oh my God, I'm knocking everything everywhere. everywhere. But then you would put a level two building right there. But maybe I just wanna go from a level one to a level two. Well, I'm only going one step up. In that case, again, I just pay one jade and one corn because I'm only moving up one level. And I would move this to a level two. That is the construction site. So next let's talk about the military school. This works very similar to how the construction site works, but for your troop abilities. Do remember just like that, this represents what level troop ability upgrade you can get. We all start off at level one in the first round, so you can build your level one troop buildings. It works very similarly. In this case, I already have a level one military school, so I could pay three, if I take the military school action, I could pay three corn multiplied by the level I want to build, in this case, a level one, and I could put a level one in either of the troops that I choose. On a future turn, if I took this action again, I could pay three corn, and I could put a level one down in here, or maybe I even wanna put it here. Do note that it tells you the max level you can put in there. Max level one, two, and three. So this spot here could hold a one, a two, or a three, one or a two, and a one. So you could have all three level ones if you wanted to, but you're never gonna have more than two level twos and more than one three. I will go over the specifics of what all of these upgrades are at the end of the video when I talk about icons. However, it is also in your player aid. Now the military barracks. Notice it says plus three. This means a few things. This is your troop limit size. Meaning, if this is my troop, he can never have more than three warriors. If you take this action, it does not mean that you just add three troops to your current troop, because you're exceeding your troop limit. However, if I took that action and I had no troops there, if I'm this yellow player, I could add three. If I had two guys there and I took that action, I could add one. Simple as that. You're basically reinforcing one of your troops, one of them, up to your limit. If you ever have this building upgraded all the way to a level three and you took that action, well now you can have five of your little warrior units with your guy as well as spending two corn to draw a random battle card. Just like the military troop upgrades, I will talk about what all these upgrades mean at the end of the video. It is also in your player aid. Now, the temple. This is the fun one because if we place our action token there, this is how we get 
these fun little monsters that we had set up at the beginning. The way you do that is you pay two jade times the level you want to buy. So if I'm buying a level one spider, two times one is two, so I pay two jade, and now I get this fun spider to my troop. Keep in mind you can only summon to the level that you're on on this track. At the beginning of the game, you can only summon a level one monster. So after taking a look, we decide we want to get this spider. We're gonna take this token, we're gonna take the mini, and we're gonna take the card. The card you just got is gonna go with the cards you already have. The token must be tied with one of your specific troops. Let's say we wanna put it with this guy. He's the mini with his two little swords down. That would be this one. So we put him with him right there. They are not considered units, so they do not go against your troop limit. Next, you're gonna take one of your timer tokens. These represent the different rounds of the game. You're gonna put the current round that you are on. In this case, round one. This means at the end of round one, during, after the revolution phase, he's going to go away. So at the time you take this action, you pay the two jade times the level of monster you want to buy, you tie them to a troop, put them with them, put the timer token there. At this time, you can also pay additional jade. For every additional jade you spend, you can up the timer token. So let's say I spent two jade to make him go to round three. That means I will have the spider monster with that troop until the end of the revolution phase of round three, at which time he will go back to the supply. You cannot, at any time before round, the end of round three, exchange him out for a different monster. He's tied to you. Now, if you ever pay enough jade to go past the fourth level, you will actually flip this over and you'll get two victory points at the end of the game. Lastly, we have the granary. If you take this action, you simply get three corn. Pretty straightforward. So now let's talk about our different leaders' actions. If we take the city leader action, you get to choose one of these three options. You do not get all three. You can choose to get two corn or one jade, or you can pay one jade to the bank to draw a battle card. After you've chose one of those, you get the bonus of whatever action you chose here. In this case, I could choose to get another jade or another corn. If I had this one, I could pay three corn to draw three battle cards and choose one. If I had this one, I would be able to reinforce both of my troops out on the map up to my max size of whatever this is, in this case, three. Next, if I choose to activate one of these two leaders, they work in the same way. So let's say I'm activating this one here with his two swords down. First, you're gonna want to move your troops. So because I activated this particular troop here with his two little swords down, I'm only going to be affecting that troop, not my other troop. By default, you can pay one corn to move from anywhere in the jungle to any central city that does not contain your own troop. That's a no-no. But if you go to a central city that is unoccupied, you get a bonus jade for that. Going to unoccupied cities automatically gives you a free jade. You can also take all the jade that is there. In this case, there is one. Why is there jade there? Because at the end of the revolution phase, which we'll talk about in a minute, any empty city gets jade placed there. So in this particular case, if I chose to activate this troop and move them here, I would get one bonus jade for going to an empty city, one jade because there's a jade there. Then I could choose to activate the, temp or the central city. When you activate a city, you're gonna be activating depending on what turn it is. During turn one, you only have access to the bottom row here. This is depicted on our pyramid. This shows you during round one, you can only pick from the bottom row. In the second turn, you can pick from the bottom two rows. So I could pick from these two. During the third round, you can pick from any of those three rows. To be clear, 
when you're picking these, you are only ever get one option. You're not getting the thing and everything below it. You're not getting the whole row. If it's the first round and I choose the bottom row, I can get one of these options. During the second turn, I could get one of these options or one of these options, so on and so forth. The fourth round is a little bit special because all of these pyramids have a different colored little item at the top. This is a bonus. This you will get in addition to whatever you choose. So in this particular case, in the fourth round, I could spend two jade to take a prisoner from the supply and I would get a victory point. That's just one example there. Every pyramid or central city, I should say, has different rewards, different bonus actions, etc. Now, in the case, if I were to activate this troop and go to a city that has an opposing uh, troop there, this will trigger a battle. So let's go over how battles work. Before you get to activate the city, you have to actually live through the battle and stay in that city. So you have to battle first. You need not get the rewards and then battle. You must battle, then maybe get the rewards depending on what happens. Step one is the preparation phase. This is where you're gonna take all your battle cards and you're going to choose one. Your opponent is going to do the same thing. You're gonna put them face down and then you'll go to step two. So in this particular case, blue player has chosen a card and yellow player has chosen a card. Both people reveal their cards. Then we do step two, which is confrontation. This is where each player is going to be summoning up the strength on their battle card. This is this little number at the bop top left. Sometimes it's a zero, sometimes it's a one. It could be whatever it shows. It's going to be if I can, that particular symbol with a number. You're going to add that number to the strength of your troop. The strength of your troop is basically one for each piece of plastic. Your leader gives you a one. Each of these warriors gives you a one. So in this particular case, yellow's troop has a strength of four. Blue's troop has a strength of three. Then we add up the battle cards in addition to that. So yellow now has five. Blue still has three because he played a zero. Then you're going to add up the potential strength given by your troop abilities. You may have some sort of upgraded ability that gives you strength like this. In this particular case, we're going to pretend they don't have that. Then you get the potential strength given by a summoning that is tied to that troop. In this case, blue has a spider. A spider gives him an extra one strength that's tied to his troop. So he's going to have a total of one for the spider, two, three, four with this zero. Yellow is going to have one, two, three, four, and five. Because yellow has the most strength, they are the winner of the battle. There is a possibility that you could have a tie. But either way, we go to step three, which is the resolution. There are two cases here. There is either a winner or there is a draw. In case of a winner, like this case where yellow has a higher strength, the winner gets one unit as a prisoner. They take that from the opposing player and put it into their prison. Then every player applies the bonus from their battle card. Different battle cards have different bonuses. This card in particular gives them a prisoner during step three. That would mean he could also take this prisoner. Whereas blue did not win and they don't have any special abilities that are going to give them a prisoner. So they're not taking anybody. Then you're going to place the opposing troop into the jungle. This means if somebody lost, such as blue, he's going to go back into the jungle. Then each player is going to remove from the game or discard the battle cards they played. That means all of these cards are one time use. There's a couple different situations though. There's one particular card that you start with that has this little symbol on here. That means after you play this card, it goes back to your hand. This card and basically every other card does not have that, so they're all one-time use and they get discarded. 
If it is one of your starting cards, the like the one with the color, it's actually completely removed from the game. There's a difference between discarding and completely removing because uh, your starting cards get removed from the game, whereas normal other special battle cards just get discarded. Why is that? Because if you ever go through all of your special cards in the deck, you can reshuffle these and create a new deck. But you're not going to be shuffling in your starting cards. So, other than this starting card, which will always guarantee you have at least one card to play, be very careful about how you use these because they're one-time use. Your starting cards, 100% for one-time use. These other cards you play will get discarded. A lot of these different cards have many different iconography in different situations. Those are all mostly on your player aid. I'm gonna be talking about what all those symbols mean and the ones that are not on your player aid at the end of the video. Now, what happens if there's a draw? Perhaps these are the cards both players play. They both play a zero. Again, the spider, because of his particular ability, gives him a strength plus another three, so he's at four. And yellow player is also at four. There is a draw. Nobody gets to take a prisoner from each other because nobody technically won. In this situation, both players will play any special abilities that apply to a step three from either their summoning or their cards, both players will do that. And then the defender still goes to the jungle. Ties favor the attacker. In either case, in a win or a draw, if the player who just moved their troop into the city is still there, they then get to activate the city as discussed earlier. And then the cards are discarded, or again, these particular cards go back to your hand. Now, there's also a couple unique situations that may arise in battles. So let's go over each of those. First of all, and I'm going to use these zero cards for blue to keep it simple. You may have a situation like this, where blue is all on his own and yellow is going to win the victory. We got five to one. So if there are no prisoners to take, you are essentially wiping out that troop. What happens is... Yellow gets to remove blue from the board, and he gets a prisoner from the supply to go to his prison. Then, blue player gets to put his blue troop back into the jungle, along with uh, three more warriors from the supply to completely refill his troop. Now, if you do have one of the upgrades that allows you to have a bigger base uh, strength, you just fill up to your max of whatever your troop size is. Also, whichever player, in this case yellow, wiped out the opposing troop, they also get a victory point. So you get a victory point anytime you completely wipe a troop. But it's not so bad if you're the one getting wiped out because you basically get a free refill of guys back into the jungle. If a troop wipes out a troop with a summoning, the same thing essentially still applies. The troop leader gets removed. The player who wiped them out gets a prisoner into their supply. The player who was wiped out gets to place them in a jungle along with their tide summoning as well as as many warriors as their troop size. Back, refilled, and ready for revenge. Something else to point out is you will never get more prisoners than is what available in their troop. In this case, blue only has one character there it's impossible to get more than one troop from him. So even though yellow wins the battle and takes him and gets a pri uh, one prisoner for that, he also played a card that allowed him to take a prisoner. He's kind of just out of luck with that because there's no more prisoners to take. You never just take them from the supply. You can only get a maximum of however many people they have there. If blue had this, he'd get one prisoner for winning the battle, and he would get a prisoner for the card, which again would be this leader. So he would get a prisoner from the supply in that case, and then blue could refill. There is one last unique situation that I know of that may happen. Yellow could activate his troop and come in here, which would normally cause a battle, except for the fact that he has 
this clan upgrade. Anytime you have a monster or a clan upgrade that has this black prisoner symbol, that means you take the prisoner during step one. That means it's before you choose cards and everything. So in this particular case, blue is on his own. So he gets removed from the board. Yellow gets a prisoner from the supply. Blue goes back out into the jungle, refreshed with his troops. But now there's nobody to battle. So no battle takes place. You may also have a unique situation like this. Yellow may have activated this troop He's all by himself. He pays a corn to go into his city. While well, there's an opposing troop there with blue and a mini, or a little warrior, and so he causes a battle. Step one, they both prepare a card and they reveal their cards. Then they get to confrontation. They add up their strength. In this case, yellow has one plus three, which is four. Blue has two plus one, which is three. In this case, yellow wins the battle. Because they won the battle, they get to take a troop. Blue lost, but blue still gets to take a prisoner. Well, that's yellow's only troop. So he gets removed, and blue gets a prisoner from the supply. But blue still lost. Blue gets moved into the jungle. Then yellow gets to replenish. Because they won the battle in the city, they get to replenish in there along with their maximum troop size. In this situation, yellow got wiped out, but blue gets a victory point because blue wiped them out. But yellow gets to refresh into the city. The first time you take a prisoner of a particular color, you also get that clan token. This is gonna matter for the sacrifice phase, which we'll get to in a minute. You will never get more than one of these of a particular player. That's why in a three player game, we only have two of each because you'll only be able to get one of each one. So again, whether you take that prisoner from winning or from a card, it doesn't matter. You could lose and take a prisoner, you get one of these clan tokens. So let me make a little clarification about these clan tokens because it can be a little bit confusing in the rule book. Basically, the first time uh, you ever take a prisoner from a particular color, uh, it's not your own color obviously, you get one of their clan tokens. You can only ever have one of a particular color. You cannot have two of somebody's color. But once you make a sacrifice, if you use that clan token, you now no longer have that color. Therefore, if you attack them again and take a prisoner, you can get that clan token again. So you're incentivized to attack all the other players to get their clan tokens, which are additional sacrifice points. If you hold on to them, you're not gonna get any more. So as you can see, activating a troop can cause a lot of snowball effects here. There's a lot of possible situations that can arise, especially depending on what kind of cards you play. Again, at the end of the video, I'll be talking about a lot of what those different icons can do. But essentially, if you activate a troop, you move that particular troop, make sure you move the correct mini, and you move them into a city by paying a corn, or from a city to another city paying two corn. If nobody's there, you get a bonus jade, plus any jade that happens to be there already. You activate the city, depending on the level, and if you go to a city where there is an opposing troop, you have a battle. You do all your step one effects, you pick a card, you play the card, you add up the total strength, meaning the strength from the card, the total of the troops. Keep in mind, the minis themselves do not necessarily give you strength, okay? It's only if the token itself says it gives you strength, like at the bottom here. But not all monsters give you strength. For example, this little bird guy, he doesn't give you any strength. He just lets you move a little faster. Don't make the mistake of assuming just having a monster makes you stronger, it doesn't. Then you have to figure out who the winner is. The winner automatically gets a prisoner from that person's troop. Then you apply card effects, which may be prisoners, maybe resources, maybe whatever. Whoever lost is gonna go into the jungle. And if the attacker won and is now gets to activate that city, they activate the city, 
It's a lot, right? Uh, it might take you a round or two to really grasp onto that idea, but it does make sense after you kind of do it a couple times. Now we enter the sacrifice phase. Just remember the sacrifice phase happens after all the players have placed all three of their buildings and activated all three of their leaders. At which point you can take all of your prisoners, clan tokens, and resources of your choice to make sacrifices. You can use a clan token for a sacrifice. You can use however many warriors you want as a sacrifice. Every two jade counts as a sacrifice and every four corn counts as a sacrifice. So in this particular situation, everybody's going to si simultaneously reveal what they have. In this case, I am not sacrificing this prisoner. I'm gonna save him for the next round. But I have one, two, this counts for three, and these count for four. So I've made four sacrifices. All of your sacrifices go back to the supply. The amount of sacrifice and victory points you get is gonna be dependent on the round. In the first round, you get three sacrifice and victory points per sacrifice. In the second round, they're each worth two. The third round, they're still worth two. And in the fourth and final round, they're all worth one. So let's pretend this is the fourth round that we made those four sacrifices. Well, four sacrifices times three points for the first round means I got 12 sacrifice points. So we're gonna move the sacrifice marker all the way to the 12. Well, we also got 12 victory points. So we're also gonna move this to the 12. Like so. We're going to pretend in this first round that blue sacrificed two prisoners, which would give him six points for the first round. Both sacrifice and victory points. We're gonna say yellow sacrificed three, which put his green on the nine, as well as his victory point marker on the nine. Next, we're gonna look at the city leaders during the sacrifice phase. Whoever made the most sacrifice points and moved their sacrifice marker will get to move up on the city leaderboard. In this particular case, yellow made the most sacrifices and moved his marker so yellow moves up to the first level. When you get to the first level of that city leader, you get to upgrade the city leader to the first level, indicated on the back of this token. This one means you're basically on the first step of that temple, and you can place this corn on the corresponding spot of your city leader portion of your board. You do not get to just choose which upgrade you get. The jade one, is for when you get to the second level. And the third one, if you manage to get all the way to the third step, is this token here. You now get victory points based on where your leader is at on this uh, city pyramid. The first level gives one point, second level gives two points, and the third level would give three points. In this case, yellow is on the first level, so yellow gets one more victory point. Blue and green are not on any steps yet, so they don't get any points. Then, in turn order, anybody who is able to move their sacrifice marker that turn gets to move up on the evolution board. There are two little exceptions to this. During the first round, anybody who moved their sacrifice marker, which will be everybody, because everybody should have sacrificed at least one person, gets to move two spots. So after the first round, you'll be moving two evolutions um, in turn order. So if yellow was first, maybe they move here and they move here. They will then get the corresponding rewards. In this case, they get two jade for that spot and they get two corn for this spot. Then the other players do the same thing. Maybe green moves here, he would get two jade and two corn, and maybe blue moves here and here. He would get two jade and two jade to get four total jade. 
Again, that portion is important and why I kind of suggest you going against using those 3D pyramids because they don't show those rewards and those resources are important. So make sure you get those. Then we go to the revolution phase. The first step is for every player to look at any monsters they currently have. And if it is now the end of the round that their timer token is on, they will take that timer token, put it back in their tray. Then they will take the token, the monster from that troop, as well as that card, if it has not been played already, and it will go back to the supply to be summoned again by somebody else later. To be clear, if the battle card for a particular monster that you summoned has not been played, it always goes back. You don't get to like hold on to it. Two, if you did play that card already, instead of going to the discard pile, it goes back to the monster row so that when you're done with that monster, he'll go back and the card will always be available for whoever summons it. Then you're gonna take a look at the board and if there's any empty cities, you get to place a jade at that city. Now at this point, if it's the end of round four, you'll get to end game scoring, which we'll talk about in a minute. But otherwise, after every other round, whoever has the first player token gets to choose who gets it. Then you do the actual revolution of the revolution phase and you turn the wheel to the next round, which will show you the available city bonuses when you go activate a city, the sacrifice points for the next marker, and then it just reminds you to do the evolution. Also, in future rounds, the second, third, and fourth round, you can only move the evolution marker if you've also moved your sacrifice marker. So, what does that mean? Well, this was our state after the first round. So, even if after the second round, the yellow player sacrificed a clan token and one, two, three, four, five, for a total of six sacrifices, the second round sacrifices are only worth two points. That would be a total of 12 sacrifice points. But, they're already on the 12 from the previous round. So they will still score 12 victory points, which would put them at 25 victory points. However, because they did not sacrifice more than their previous round, they will not be able to move up on the evolution board. Whereas, let's say the green player, who only needs to beat nine sacrifice points, he might sacrifice four warriors, one, two, three, four, and maybe two jade for a total of five sacrifices. Well, since the second round is two points, five sacrifices would make it 10 sacrifice points. Therefore, this moves, they would get 10 points, bringing them to 19, and they could make another move on this board which means they could now get to the third level of their previous choices. If they ever get to the third level here, that is drawing an extra battle card. If they chose to go to the third level here, that's an extra two corn. But if anybody ever gets to the third level here, what the heck does this mean? This is actually a misprint. It's been clarified by the designer on the board game Geek. What it means is, you'll see there's a level three there. It simply means you get a free level three construction site. So whatever you had there before, go ahead and remove that and put in your free level three, putting the other one back to your little supply here. Now, let's say blue somehow made six sacrifices as well. Well, that would be 12 sacrifices points, which would tie him right here, and he would score 12 victory points, which would bring him to 18. So in our particular situation, yellow doesn't get to move up any of these tracks because they were not able to move their sacrifice marker, but blue and green did. So maybe green goes here to get a couple corn, and blue goes here 
to get a free level 3 construction site. So while Yellow Player currently has the most points, they are now not getting the ability to get these level 3 things. Also, we have to look at the city leaders here. While Yellow tied for the most sacrifice points, they did not also move their sacrifice marker, so they will not move up. Whereas Blue, he tied for the most sacrifice points and he moved his marker, so Blue would move up. The only time somebody moves up is if they score the most sacrifice points or tied for the most sacrifice points and move their sacrifice marker. And then again, you score points for the level. Yellow would get another point. Blue would get another point. Yellow and blue. There is a very real possibility that whoever scored the most sacrifice points does not move up their sacrifice marker. In this situation, nobody moves up on that city leader pyramid. Now, once we get to the fourth round, we have to remember, since we only get one sacrifice point for every sacrifice, it may be very difficult to move up these sacrifice markers. So you wanna be careful in the early game about sacrificing too many, but at the same time you get more points, so it's kind of a risk reward thing. Now lastly, a very special situation happens at the end of the fourth round. Before final scoring, if you are eligible to move up an evolution token, and if you're able to get to the fourth level, you're eligible to score end game points. We'll talk about that in a second. Again, keep in mind the 3D pyramids, if you're using those, do not actually have a fourth level to go up to. So again, you're gonna need that board to remember that. So now if we're going to end game scoring, we're gonna look at anybody that has tokens in the fourth level here. These are not one space. As many people can be here as was eligible to get here. But each of these three are gonna score a little bit differently. If you get to the fourth level of this particular row, you're gonna get one point for every building level. What does that look like? In this case, he has a level three, a level one, and a level three. That's three, four, five, six, seven victory points. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Boom. If you get to the fourth level of this particular row, you're gonna get one point per uh, troop upgrade that you have based on the level. Thus the symbols. So this would be one plus two plus three plus three plus two plus one for a maximum total of 12. If you get to the fourth level of the summoning row, you get two points for every summoning level. For that, you're gonna to wanna to flip these little tokens over to see their summoning level. In this case, we have three, four, five times two for 10 points. Again, this could be a maximum of 12 if you had two level threes. All of these are basically a maximum of 12, and you'll never reach more than one of these final columns just based on how it works. Then, for every two jade that you own, you will also get a victory point. Then, for every four corn that you have, you will also get a victory point. Also, it's very easy to forget to score those two bonus victory points on the back of your timer. If you made any of your summons, flip over, like if you went past the virtual fourth round into like the virtual fifth round or whatever, you flip it over, you can get a maximum of four victory points if you do that for both of them. And lastly, you're gonna get a victory point for every battle card you still have in your hand. In this case, one, two, three, four, five victory points. Now at this point, whoever has the most victory points is the winner. If there's a tie, the tie is broken by whoever has the most sacrifice points. If there's still a tie, somehow, you share the victory. And that is Yucatan, okay? You got four rounds, each one consisting of three phases, the action phase, the sacrifice phase, and the revolution phase, the action phase, being three turns of each putting out a building and a leader in either order, blah, 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 fighting, 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 resources, 
temples, moving up buildings, upgrades, blah, 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 victory points. But there's a big caveat, unfortunately. The fact is the rule book, yikes. These player aids, uh, they, they all leave a bit much to be desired, right? So at this point in the video, we're gonna talk about some rules clarifications and some symbology things. First, a clarification that was discussed by the designer on BGG is that this pile of special cards, whenever all the cards are discarded, they are discarded face up. They're not face down, they are face up. Anything discarded is public knowledge and yeah. There you go. Now, while there is a lot of symbology on the back of the rule book, there is a lot missing. So let's go over each one of those. First of all, there's this one right here, that little black looking card. What this card means is after battle in step three, you can either choose to take a prisoner or you can pay two corn to claim the card that was just played by your opponent. So, that means whatever card they played, you can just then take it to your hand and you'll have that benefit from now on. The only exception to that being, you cannot take their zero card that they can refresh back to their hand. Any other card though, that's yours now. Next, we have this one. This, I think it's focusing there. That one right there, there's a little X through the symbology for the victory. What does that mean? That means if you are not victorious, you can pay two corn to get your card back. So you get a prisoner and if you lost, you can possibly get this card back. Next, we have this one, which is a fun one. I think there's only one of these in the deck, but there's a picture of a skull with a little refresh symbol. What does that mean? Well, when you get to step three there and you're resolving all your stuff, you can look through the discard pile and take any card you want into your hand. Maybe I want this one, huh? So that's what that one does. Next, this one here. This one shows the symbology for a summon with little arrows going to each other. What does that mean? Does it mean you can take summons from your thing and replace them with ones in the supply or steal somebody from somebody else's? No. What that allows you to do is it allows you to switch place of any summons that you had, as well as their timers, or in the situation that maybe you only had one, you could switch it to your other troop. Next, we have the card that shows the city being activated twice. Now, the designer has clarified on BGG that essentially it works the same way as this ant eater here. So a lot of people are confused because this does not show the symbology that says you must be the attacker. So some people assumed, well, can you use this on defense and activate the city twice? No. The designer clarified on BGG, this only benefits you if you're the attacker because you would be the one activating the city. You can then activate it twice, but you must choose two separate rewards. You cannot choose the same reward twice. What was not clarified is the bonus at the top. Do you get that twice? Who the hell knows? The way I view it, is you're activating the city twice, so you get the bonus twice. The last symbol to go over very specifically is this one. This is on a lot of cards. It is the push symbol. Now, on the actual rule book on the back, it says push into the jungle while being defeated. Well, it doesn't say you have to be the attacker. So can you use this as the defender? No. The designer has clarified it works the same way as this little clan upgrade that is in your um, player aid, which says if this troop is the attacker and is defeated, place the opposing troop into the jungle. What does that mean in practice? Essentially, if you're a defender, that doesn't do anything. You still get the strength if you need to use it, 
but this only matters if you're the attacker and essentially it guarantees you that no matter what, you'll be able to activate the city. Because if you lose, well, that pushes the winner into the jungle and you get to activate the city, or you win, in which case you still activate the city. So those are good if you're the attacker, not so much if you are the defender. Next, let's talk kind of quickly about these different um, advisors and city leader upgrades. Okay, remember you're gonna be choosing two of these at the beginning and one of these at the beginning. If you choose the reinforced one, this essentially says that whenever you activate your city leader, both of your troops will be basically brought up to whatever your max uh, troop size is. If you do this middle one here, when you activate your city leader, you can pay three corn and you can draw three battle cards, choose one of them to keep, the other two will get discarded face up into the discard pile. And if you take this last one, it's pretty straightforward. You get um, either one jade or two corn in addition to whatever other option you chose. Now, when it comes to the advisors, they are a little weird in how they're worded. For example, some of them say step three, which is kind of referring to a battle, but you don't have to battle to get these bonuses. You get them anytime you activate the leader. So, for example, if you take this one here, anytime you take uh, your, that particular troop with that upgrade to a city and you take corn as one of the rewards, you will get an additional two corn. And it essentially works the same way with the jade. If you activate the troop with this upgrade and you end up activating a city and taking jade, you get one additional jade. This matters importantly because if you play that particular battle card, if I can find it here, that lets you activate the city twice, well, seems like you get that bonus twice, doesn't it? So for example, if you are in round three and you go to this city and you have that Jade Advisor upgrade with the troop that you brought here and you either fight and stay here or it's just an empty one and you come here, and you play the card that lets you activate it twice, well, you can activate two different things on there. So perhaps you take the three jade, which you then get an additional jade for, for a total of four. Then you activate this one to get two jade with your additional one for a total of three. Therefore, you're getting seven jade in one action. If this happened to be an empty city with a jade already there, you could get a total of nine jade in one turn. That's pretty sweet. Probably not gonna happen, but it could. Next, if you take this particular advisor, anytime you have a battle during step three, you can pay two corn and a jade to take an additional prisoner. Now, the reason we're going over some of these is because of the iconography, right? These ones have slashes, where in the rule book, it's saying the slash means or, but on these particular ones, this is not an or, this is more like in addition to. If you activate a city tile for jade, you get an extra jade. It's not saying or get a jade. Uh, that's one of those weird component things. But if you are now playing with the five to six player expansion, you can include this tile. This one says, step three, when this troop activates a central city, you may resolve the summon action depending on your temple. So what does that mean? Essentially, you have to activate a central city. So you're either going to an empty one or you've been through a battle and now you're still there, you're not in the jungle and you're activating a central city. You then get to activate the summoning action as if you took the building action based on your level. So if you're at level zero, you're gonna pay two jade to summon a creature at a particular level. I'm not sure how useful that is, at, but I'm assuming in a five, six player game, summons are getting taken all over the place. So it allows you a way to kind of get an extra summon out of there. So now let's talk about these clan upgrades or the troop abilities. If you take this one after a battle, after everyone has resolved the taking a prisoner step, you then get to reinforce that troop up to your max amount. Again, 
Depending on what level you have your barracks at, you may have three, four, or five available. If you have this upgrade, you basically permanently have a way to guarantee that troop will always be able to activate a city because that has the push icon. So anytime you activate that troop, you're going to be able to activate a city. Pretty cool. This level one is just an extra strength in battle. Level two abilities. Again, you have to be on level two on the evolution track for the clan upgrades. This one right here basically gives you a permanent strength. Also, if you're victorious in battle, in step three, you can make a prisoner. This one right here, essentially, if you've made at least two prisoners during that battle, you get a victory point. Pretty cool. This one here is saying, if you are the attacker, not the defender, you can basically ignore their summoning abilities. So for example, if someone has something that's going to give them all this extra stuff, you essentially cancel that. It's like they're not there. Then we get to level three. If you're on level three of the uh, clan upgrade or troop abilities, you can get these level threes. This one right here basically gives you a permanent strength. And um, during step three, you can gain another special battle card from the deck, which those can be hard to come by, so that can be pretty cool. You're never going to be completely depleted. This one right here gives you a permanent strength, as well as... Oh, excuse me, I'm allergic to these bad rules. Um, you get one strength, and in addition, anytime you're victorious in battle, you get two victory points. Cool. This one here is a really special one because it's that black-looking prisoner. That sounds really bad. But just the iconography, it's the black one. Um, that one is step one, make a prisoner. That means you're going to be weakening their strength before you play the troop cards and resolve it. So you're guaranteed a prisoner, no matter what, before you ever even do anything. And potentially even wipe out their troop if they only have their leader there. And you may not even have to battle. So now, the building upgrades, or building abilities as they say. We already kind of talked about these, and essentially these just become more efficient as you go up and sometimes allow you to get some more battle cards. So we already kind of talked about how these buildings work. Essentially, for the construction building, it makes it more efficient and cost-effective to upgrade your other buildings or itself. So you pay one jade and one corn, or one jade, or one jade, per level step up that you're going. Again, I'm gonna reinforce, if you're going from like a level two to a level three, you're not paying three jade because it's a level three, you're only going one step up, so it's only one jade. But if you're going from a zero to a three, then you'd pay three jade for this one because you're going three steps up. People can get a little kind of confused about how that works for this particular one. If you get all the way to level three here, in addition to upgrading another building, you can also pay two corn to draw another special battle card. Remember, these are gonna give you a lot of flexibility with things you can do in the game, as well as being worth victory points at the very end. Then we have our clan upgrades, and again, they are all basically the same thing, just more efficient. Three corn for, per level of upgrade, two corn, and one corn per level of upgrade. So if you wanted to buy a level three upgrade, and you're on level three on the evolution track, you could go from a level zero to a level three just by paying three corn if you have that particular building. Pretty cool. Then we have these three buildings here, level one, level two, and level three. These are basically your reinforcement buildings, your barracks. They uh, increase the troop size that you can have. So first we go to a troop size of four. Level two, we get a troop size of four, and when you activate this building, you can also pay three corn in order to get a special battle card, one of them. And all the way up here, you can pay two corn for a special battle card, and your max troop size is five. So if you were to activate this building, one of your troops could be reinforced to a maximum of five, as well as getting another troop card. Lastly, we have the three temple upgrades. Again, these basically just make them more efficient. So 
one jade and one corn per level of summon that you're getting. So if you had a level three summon, you'd be paying three jade and three corn. As opposed to if you were all the way up here to level three and you bought a level three summon, it would just cost you three jade. And in addition, you could pay two corn to, you guessed it, get another battle card. Lastly, we have the summons on the back of the player aid. I actually do think they do a pretty good job explaining what all of these do, so there's no reason to go over all of these. If you do have any questions about any of the icons or iconography or special situations that may arise, please feel free to ask in the comments below. And a couple last things to clarify. On this particular city, when you're taking this prisoner as a bonus, that one does come from the supply, whereas they usually come from an opponent's troop. Also, these particular types of um, city bonuses, like there and like here, they work the same way as if you were taking that building action, but you're going to be paying the cost that's on here as opposed to what's on your board. So something like this might be more efficient. Again, this particular city is for more advanced players. But my understanding is this big X through the summon essentially means summons don't do anything at this city. But it has some interesting bonuses. For example, you can take one of your prisoners and put it back into the supply to get three victory points. At the top is a bonus. You can also get a victory point. This symbol here, I haven't seen any explanation for what it means. The way I read this, is you get a level three um, building of your choice. But that also seems really powerful because you could go from a level zero to a level three just as a bonus. If you were to activate this with one of those city cards that lets you activate it twice, you'd get three level three buildings. I don't know. It also has the number underneath, which kind of like here is usually represents a cost. The way they explain cost in the rule book is anytime you see a number above, that's a something you're gaining. Anytime you see a number below, that's something you're paying. So they have this three below a city. Uh, uh, your guess is as good as mine. Now, I will say, as my final thoughts, I do enjoy this game. I do think the rules are a bit ambiguous. I wish we didn't have to search Board Game Geek all over the place. Hopefully this was helpful for, to you, helpful for you. I know it was a long video, but um, I did the best I could. There are obviously still some things that I don't know. Hopefully they come out with a new rule book and you won't even need this video. Um, if you have any questions about anything about the game, feel free to ask below. If I made any mistakes, which I probably did, feel free to point those out. And as if I come up with any more clarifications or things that I got wrong, I will post them in the comments. I'll pin them at the top with my mistakes or I'll put them in the comments of my video. But that is Yucatan. Make sure you like and subscribe and watch more videos.